Okay, um, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this, uh, to the third session of this webinar series on transformative pedagogy for peace and resilience building and prevention of violent ex uh, extremism. This third session will deal with um, experiences in youth empowerment. So I, I can't wait to hear from all the panelists and speakers today. Uh, but before we get on to the, um, the, the webinar itself, just a few instructions and, 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 and housekeeping uh, instructions for you all in order for this to be a uh, good uh, Zoom webinar. Oops, there you go. Uh, in terms of very simple technical aspects, uh, I'm sure many of you have used Zoom in the past for those who are returnees to the webinar, uh, but those for, for just as a reminder regarding camera, microphone, and Q&A, for optimal viewing of the webinar, kindly mute yourselves and refrain from activating your camera to, in order to uh, ensure that you will be able to watch the webinar uh, smoothly. And if you have any questions for the panelists at any point during the webinar, please feel free to use the chat functionality in the middle of your uh, Zoom. Uh, and we will uh, do our best to, to ensure that your questions are addressed or and or answered at any point during the webinar. Finally, uh, we have a child safe safeguarding policy which goes as follows. We aim to ensure a safe, inclusive, inclusive space for the children and young people taking part in today's event. To that end, any speakers or any participants today who are under 18 years of age are identified only with their first name. Um, so if you are a participant or a speaker under the age of 18 within the audience, we kindly ask you to not include your, or your full name as your Zoom name and only use your first name. And if there's any concerns, do feel free to send me uh, a message at any point uh, during the webinar regarding any questions regarding this policy as well. Um, but I will give the floor to Marila, uh, Marila, Maria Lucia Uribe uh, for uh, the webinar itself. Thank you. Thank you, Javier, for these instructions. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Maria Lucia Uribe and the Executive Director of Arigato International Geneva, and I will be moderating this uh, panel discussion today. Thank you to the panelists joining us today, but also to the many participants joining us from different parts of Africa, but also I believe from several parts of the, of the world. Uh, today, as Javier mentioned, uh, this is the third of a series of webinars on lessons learned in promoting transformative pedagogy for peace and resilience building, prevention of violent extremism and learning to live together in Africa. And what is exciting about today is that we'll be hearing from the experiences of youth and youth-led organizations from Kenya, Nigeria, Uganda, and Zambia. The, the panelists today uh, will be sharing um, with us uh, how they have been leading the activities in their countries, uh, what kind of activities they have been leading, their experiences, their lessons learned, the impact the program has, has had uh, in the beneficiaries, in changes they have uh, perceived, but also the challenges that they have experienced. And we hope that uh, throughout the webinar, we'll be able also to, to get into a dialogue, share more the, the your questions, and that they will be able also to share maybe more details of these uh, experiences. Uh, we have uh, very concrete objectives today. Uh, one, as mentioned, is to share these experiences. Second is to articulate the relevance of transformative pedagogy in responding to contextual realities and challenges in the different parts of Africa. The third is to identify the lessons learned and good case practices from the integration of transformative pedagogy in youth empowerment at national and institutional levels. And I think we all agree here that peace building is not possible without the involvement and the active participation of uh, young people. And this is what we'll be hearing today. And last but not least, we will reflect on what works well, the gaps and way forward in strengthening the use of transformative pedagogy for peace and resilience 
building and prevention of violent extremism. So we will have excellent speakers today. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Dr. Yumiko Yokoseki, who is the director of the UNESCO International Institute for Capacity Building in Africa for the welcoming remarks. Dr. Yokoseki, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, um, Madame Maria Butia Uribe. Um, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. I might ask, uh, I, I'm a bit worried about our connectivity. I'm seeing some uh, um, message that the um, connectivity is not stable. So please, I, I ask your permission to stop the video. Thank you, so, um, Yeah, thank you very much. So, um, his Excellency Ricardo Mosca, Deputy Ambassador of European Union Delegation to the African Union, Dr. Lucas Temitope Ako, African Union Youth for Peace Program Head, and Ms. Maria Lucia Uribe, Executive Director of Arigato International. And also, I'm very, very happy to welcome youth representatives, uh, Mr. Bramuel uh, Wekesa Simiyu from Kenya. Mr. Pietro Uzochuku um, Makulio from Nigeria, Mr. Eus Francis uh, from Uganda, and Ms. Gloria Higoma from uh, Zambia. Greetings to all the participants from ministries of education, universities, teachers, colleges, partners, and uh, colleagues from many parts of the Africa. It is a great honor and pleasure to welcome all the guests to this online webinar on lessons learned in promoting transformative pedagogy for peace and resilience building, prevention of violent extremism and learning to live together in Africa. Today, the third session of the series places a particular focus on youth experience. Peace is not the mere absence of violent conflicts and weapons. Peace is a condition that enables children and people to thrive and to self-actualize. Peace is a continuous action of government to build the structure that provides inclusive quality education, economic justice, and the social harmony. There can be no peace without justice. There can be no peace when oppression, hunger, of the body and mind, inequality and other structural violence exist. Conversely, structural violence drives conflict and makes societies more vulnerable and unequal. Education can be a powerful tool to address oppression and inequality, the root causes and drivers of conflict. Through strong, basic, inclusive education, coupled with resilience and transformative pedagogies, peace can be realized and sustained. However, peace education will not be sustainable if it is not prioritized and systematized by government. The Security Council resolution on 2250 on youth peace and security put youth at the very heart of peace building efforts. The youth population of the world is estimated at 1.8 billion, the largest it has ever been. And Africa is the youngest population. Africa has a largest proportion of the young people. UNESCO views young people youth as both partners and beneficiaries in this project due to the crucial role that young women and men can play and have been playing in promoting peace and security. For these reasons, UNESCO's peace building efforts focus heavily on youth empowerment. Peace is also one of the African Union's priorities. Aspiration four of the Agenda 2063, Africa We Want, emphasizes that the culture of peace and the tolerance shall be nurtured in Africa's children and youth through peace education. Continental Education Strategies for Africa, CESA of African Union, also calls for 
peace education and the safeguarding education in times of emergency and ensuring a safe teaching and learning environment. In collaboration with more than 24 countries in Africa, UNESCO ICBA has worked in more than 41 higher education and teacher training institutions to ensure that the educators and teachers are capacitated. This also empower young people to engage with their societies as active citizens and champions of peace. I hope this series of webinars will provide an opportunity for African youth to share their experiences and get the new perspectives on how to systematize and integrate peace building and the prevailing, uh, preventing violent extremism in uh, youth programs. To all the participants, thank you very much for the inputs that you will be making to the discussions at the webinar and for the practices and knowledges you are going to share. Finally, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to the Japanese Embassy of Ethiopia and the government of Japan for funding the project called Prevention of Extremism and its resurgence amid the COVID-19 pandemic through education in Africa aligned with the spirit of Take Ad 7 and the NAPSA. Um, NAPSA is new approach to peace and security in Africa. So I wish you all a very successful and exciting de deliberation today. Thank you very much. Over to you. Many thanks, uh, Dr. Yokoseki, uh, for reminding us that uh, Peace is not just the absence of war, but it's actually the presence of the conditions to achieve justice and uh, equity and equality in, in, in our societies, and for reminding us of the critical role that young people uh, play in, in building peace. Now I'd like to invite um, the Honorable Mr. Ricardo Mosca, Deputy Ambassador of the European Union Delegation to the African Union, to provide us with the keynote. Mr. Mosca, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Maria Lucia, and um, uh, uh, greetings to everybody uh, from Addis Ababa, from the new delegation to the, uh, to the African Union here in Addis. As uh, uh, you might know, and maybe all the younger uh, uh, participants to the conference uh, do not know that the European Union has two um, embassy delegation here in Addis, one bilateral to the uh, Ethiopian, the Ethiopian government, and the other one is multilateral to the African Union to uh, underline also the importance that the European Union gives to uh, multilateralism as a tool to, um, uh, to better fight for justice, for peace and stability in the world. And, uh, uh, and this is what we as the best instruments to, uh, to achieve the um, world and world for everybody. And uh, so it's, uh, it's uh, thank you very much for inviting the European Union to, uh, to this very important event. Um, let me congratulate also UNESCO and the International Institute for Capacity Building in Africa for the uh, work done on the project that brings us here today, discussing uh, how to prevent extremism and insurgent uh, is crucial in Africa, and even more to do uh, to do it through education mechanism uh, and empowerment of youth. We are all united here today because we have one common objective: to give young people the power they deserve to influence uh, our future, and in particular to positively contribute to peace and security in Africa. Uh, as the EU, we are committed to supporting young people's meaningful participation in decision-making processes, in preventing conflict and in building sustainable peace in line with the youth peace and security agenda. Uh, as you might recall, at the sixth Africa Union EU summit of the heads of state that took place recently in Brussels in February, um, 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 that summit presented the development of joint renewed partnership of, uh, for sustained economic development and prosperity for our citizens and for our future generations, bringing together our people, regions, and organizations 
Uh, during that uh, summit, uh, we have also reaffirmed our support to um, African-led initiative aimed at placing prevention and protection of civilian population at the heart of their counter-terrorist uh, efforts. efforts. Uh, in, in February, at, uh, during that summit, our leaders announced a renewed and enhanced peace and security cooperation, including joint effort to further promote the youth peace and security agenda. Uh, so the EU looks forward to continue working uh, hand in hand with the African Union and all the partners to keep the young people in the driver's seat as a positive force in preventing and resolving conflict and building sustainable peace. Uh, and in line with the uh, strategic compass for security and defense endorsed recently by the European Council, the EU further recognized uh, at the, uh, also at the most recent Foreign Affairs Council in June 20, that terrorism and violent extremists in all their forms and irrespective of their, of their origin continue to pose a major challenge in a strategic environment already impacted by multiple geopolitic, uh, geopolitic shifts and growing instability, unfortunately. Uh, as such, we recognize the need for enhanced multilateralism, multilateral engagements, and, and uh, strengthen uh, cooperation with uh, uh, strategic international partners. And the Africa Union is indeed one of our crucial partners. Um, uh, our European Council also recognized that uh, we need to strengthen a common uh, understanding of violent extremism and terrorism, including in the field of counter narratives, exchange of information, capacity building, and dissemination of uh, best uh, practice. The series of events you are organizing is, I mean, therefore, very timely. And as the COVID 19 pandemic has further increased the isolation uh, of vulnerable people and reinforced their exposure to often quick radicalization. Uh, phenomenon, uh, specifically online, we've uh, seen a very concerning uh, a tr you know, a, 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 a trend on, on how kids, on how young people could be easily influenced via the net by, uh, by some, some platforms and some uh, 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 that are, you know, feeding, uh, um, uh, feeding, uh, um, the uh, concept of instability and intolerance. Uh, uh, I mean, we believe that terrorism and violent extremists are not an inevitability, in in sorry. Defeating them requires a global effort that cannot only rely on military action, but also encompasses a civilian-led um, wall of society response aiming at, at tackling the root causes of the threat including socioeconomic inequalities, lack of good governance, uh, as well as the impact of organized crime activities and climate uh, change. Uh, education is indeed uh, of the utmost importance on all that. And youth empowerment also, especially for young women who are often seen simply as passive victims without agency to participate in conflicts or post-conflict peace processes. Um, as the importance of meaningful youth participation gains ground and recognition, the EU, the EU as such is fully on board. Uh, is a uh, European year of youth. You last year, we assisting 25 motivated young people from around the world, with 10 of which 10 of them coming from Africa. And uh, it aims to create a real long lasting change in, on how the EU engage, uh, engages with young people in its uh, uh, development cooperation. Uh, the 2020 uh, Council conclusion on youth and external action recognize young people's contribution to maintaining and promoting peace and security, as well as the need of actively engage uh, youth everywhere, always. In this context, the EU wants to further work on making sure that uh, stereotypes around gender and age do not hinder young women's participation as peace and security actors. They are indeed crucial actors on peace and security. Um, <clears throat> and on its side, the Africa Union's own commitment to further, to further meaningful youth participation is long 
uh, standing. Uh, it is in frame in the agenda uh, 2063, the African Youth Charter, and embodied by the African Union uh, Commission uh, Youth Envoy. Uh, in the field of peace and security, this priority has been clearly reaffirmed by the continental framework of youth peace and security, which provides a solid foundation and reinforced by the nomination of Africa, African Youth Ambassadors for um, therefore, the EU is fully committed to supporting this uh, young and main engagement of, of Africa. Uh, and uh, um, to be more specific concerning our programs here with the African Union, through the APSA 4 uh, support program, the EU is strengthening the implementation of the African Union continental framework on youth peace and security regional use peace and security forums and their partnership with the RECS, the regional economic communities, the RM, the regional uh, mechanism, and the CSO, the civil society, of course, which is essential. Uh, the EU also welcomed recent announcement by Commissioner Bancole on the work to establish an African Union peace, uh, youth peace and uh, mediation uh, court. Um, uh, we have expressed uh, this message of support in the recent Africa Union Tadeba and in uploading the youth uh, for their resilience and proactiveness, which contributed to Africa's ability to cope also with the COVID 19 pandemic. At the same time, the EU recognized uh, that realizing ambitions on youth participation does not go without its challenges, unfortunately. While an increasing number of young people are finding spaces to engage with EU Africa Union discussions, their participation often fell, falls short of being meaningful. Uh, additionally, the young people participating are still too often uh, from a very privileged part of the society and do not reflect the diversity, the diversity of young uh, communities across the continent. Uh, in this context, uh, both uh, the EU and the Africa Union uh, member states need to be. To do better, we need to do better and go out uh, uh, on our way to ensure that our promises are turned into reality, things that are concrete, not only words. Um, uh, to mention the, the PSC section, you know, section that took place a few days ago in Addis Ababa, the Peace and Security Council session, uh, uh, the, 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 the member of uh, the council requested the Africa Center for Studies and Research on Terrorism, which is in Alger, to conduct a study on youth indoctrination in Africa on the prevention of risks of share the commitment to work with the Africa Union to promote uh, to promote it in all fields. Young people have become the human faces of our cross-continental partnership thanks to the Africa Union Youth Track, bringing Africa and Europe closer together for people-to-people -people cooperation to tackle common challenges, challenges and aspects. Uh, the youth track, uh, the youth track encompasses inter alien place. Uh, you might remember in 2022. Mr. Mosca, we are having trouble uh, listening. It's breaking up. Mr. Mosca, are you still with us? I think, uh, yeah, his connection. Mr. Mosca, are you still there with us? Your connection yes, is indeed. breaking up. Please go ahead, Mr. Mosca. I think we, we can now hear you. You cannot hear me? Yes. Can yes. you hear me now? Hello? We do. 
I'm very sorry, but maybe it, it would make things a bit uh, easier. Yes, Mr. So, Mosca, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Okay, okay, sorry. Sorry about that. That happens pretty often here, unfortunately. Connection is not very good. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Um, so let me, yeah, I'll continue and, 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 and so for peaceful societal development, economic growth and the realization of individual potential. Uh, and on that, the Treaty of European Union expressly commits the EU to promote the protection of the rights of child, the rights to quality and inclusive education, training and lifelong learning is the first principle of the European pillar of social rights. Education is at the heart of European way of life, strengthening social market, economic and democracy with freedom, diversity, human rights and, and justice and uh, social justice. Um, education is also one of the best tools for investing in peace, stability and economic growth. Yet it's also one of the most underfunded areas of humanitarian aid. Only 3% of global humanitarian funding is allocated to education. Despite the sustainable development goal of ensuring quality education for every child, there are still 260 million children and young people who do not go to primary or secondary school. Among refugee children, only 77% have been enrolled in primary and 31% in secondary school. During armed conflict or insecurity, education comes under attack. In over 11,000 attacks during the past five years, more than 22,000 students, teachers, and academicians have been injured, killed, or harmed. Of course, COVID-19 has exacerbated the negative trends and provoked a worldwide education crisis. The most vulnerable are facing the dire consequence of the pandemic. Uh, just to give a couple of figures, 10 million more girls are at risk of early marriage and dropping out, according to UNICEF. For 163 million children globally, at least a third of the world's school children, were unable to access remote learning during school closures. Well, you know, in all this, the EU has spent over 750 million on education in emergencies between 2015 and 21. The share of education in emergency in our humanitarian budget has, sustained, has, has substantially increased in the last years, starting from 1% in 2015, it is maintained now at 10% of the humanitarian budget as of 2019, which is quite an important uh, a trench of, of, uh, of, uh, <clears throat> of the funds that are allocated. And we are, of course, eager and ready to increase it because, as I said before, education and investment on, on youth is a top priority. Um, nearly 12 million girls and boys have benefited from EU funded educational projects between. 2015, 2021. Um, therefore, you see the inclusion of young people in our Africa Union EU partnership is what makes it meaningful and concrete, bringing Africa and Europe closer together to tackle common challenges and aspiration. Uh, we therefore look forward to keep working together with youth, with UNESCO, with the African Union, with all the African partners, and uh, in the context, in, in the context of our renewed transcontinental partnership. Um, therefore, I would like to, to thank you very much for listening to me today. Uh, I would really think that these kind of initiatives you are having are extremely important. And uh, I hope that in the near future, we'll be able to all have a physical conference and meeting to, to get them even more efficient and, and concrete. Thank you very much to all. Thank you so much, uh, Honorable Mr. Mosca, and thank you for these remarks and, and the commitment of the European Union towards peace in, in, in Africa. I think it's uh, music to the ears, I think, for uh, organizations that are working on, on, on peace and education to hear um, the, a firm commi commitment from the, Afri uh, from the European Union to support uh, peace in Africa. And particularly what you said, uh, putting young people in the driving seat 
I think this is very critical. The, the information you give us, which of course is not new, that education is uh, underfunded when it comes to education in, in emergencies, that there is a critical need to address uh, the prevention of violent extremists and not just with uh, military interventions, but very critical ensuring the, the role of civil society and education. So very important remarks, um, Mr. Uh, Mosca. I'm very appreciative of your time and, and the commitment. Now I would like to acknowledge the presence of Dr. Rux Temitoke, Temit Temitope Ako from the African Union Youth for Peace. Thank you for joining us. Um, Dr. Temitope Ako will be giving the closing remarks. But uh, before, I would like us to have a, a group picture before we invite the other uh, speakers. So if you can all turn on your cameras for a group uh, picture, and, and then we continue with the panelists. Okay, uh, there are quite a number of us, so I will do this in uh, four times. So I will, I will also just, just do a countdown of three. Uh, just to ensure that I get all of uh, the people in this uh, webinar. Uh, so one, two, three. Okay, moving on to the next room. One, two, three. And the room after that, one, two, three. And last screenshot from me, one, two, three. Thank you. Thank you, Javier. Thank you so much, uh, Honorable uh, Mr. Mosca. And uh, we now proceed to the other uh, panelists, the young representatives. And we will start with uh, Mr. Bramuel with Kesa Simiyu. Apologies if I'm not pronouncing your names correctly. Um, who is the representative from the Kenyatta University for the youth team of the universities in Kenya, who will be sharing with us uh, the experiences in prevention of extremism and its resurgence in the uh, COVID-19 and its amidst the COVID-19 pandemic through education in Africa and the case of the Youth Kenya Peace Forum program. Mr. Simiyu, the floor is yours. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Kindly share the presentation. Thank you. Uh, all protocols observed, ladies and, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to my presentation. My name is Bramuel Wekesa Simiyu, representing uh, Kenyan universities. Allow, allow me to switch off my, my video. Uh, our project, Transformative Pedagogy for Peace and Resilience Building and the Prevention of Violence Extremism, is a result of many other trainings and earlier project fundings from UNESCO Ikiba to Kenyatta University, Mount Kenya University, and Kenya in general. It is important to note that through this support, most universities, and teacher education facilities have attained peace building in their capacities. It is evident from our assessment that efforts from UNESCO Ikiba are achieving their set objectives and targets in Kenya and beyond. As youth from Kenyan universities, the programs on peace and conflict resolution have molded our socialization and professionalism, and we are very happy on this. Consequently, this project is an outcome of the peace training from Kenyatta University and Mount Kenya University. Our project was guided by the principles. Uh, we, we wanted to change on slide two, please. Slide two, second slide. Our objective was to change a mind of a young visionary leader towards peaceful leadership 
and hence changing a community and group and entirely their country. Uh, secondly, we wanted, we, 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 we wanted to create awareness of the root causes of conflict and peace resolution. Lastly, we promoted personal reflection on the creation of a peaceful and healthy environment. Our implementation was through conducting of physical meetings and our trainings started from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. for one day. We were able to train 320 youth aged 15 to 37 years. 104 of these were students from four secondary schools, while 216 were youth groups from two community youth groups. I shall begin by looking at the schools in Nairobi. Please on the next slide. In Nairobi, we, we were able to train the students at Ushirika School in Dandora, which had 76 students, and Sterling Silver, Sterling Silver School, which had 38 students. Ushirika is a public school which is located near a dump site, the Kenya's largest dump site, with many communities living around. While Silver Sterling is a private school, which is situated near three universities, the school is affected by school unrest and drug addiction. And we noted that Ushirika had an inactive a peace club while Sterling did not have a peace club. Therefore, our objective in this, in, in this school, in these two schools, was to solve the school unrest and the issue of communities living together for harmony. Uh, the second group of schools was in Mombasa, where we trained at Moy Forces Academy and Shikadabu Secondary School. These schools had student representatives from the peace clubs. And also the schools are affected by violent extremism. We noted that in these schools, uh, we had different religions and we were happy that all these religions were peaceful in our trainings. I shall go to the youth group in Nairobi, we trained uh, 82 youths from Mukuru Community Youth Group. Of these, 49 were males, while 33 were females. This uh, youth group is located near, uh, it, it is found in a slum area, which is also termed as an election hotspot a hotspot for election, post-election violence. It is also affected, the group is also found in a community affected by drug and substance abuse with many cases of addiction. In Mombasa, we are able to train a group called Manyata Youth Group. It is a registered CBO. The group is found in a community that is also termed as a hotspot for post-election violence. Additionally, the group is also affected by religious extremism. But after our training, through the personal reflection, we shared a video of the post-election violence, and this arose a feeling of that the youth are willing not to, to go back to what caused the election violence. And therefore, as a result of our training, this youth, the trainees, are happy to request for support to perform a peace walk in Mombasa because it is only 44 days to the general election. And they believe this is an Ramuel, we have lost you. Can you hear us?
Ramuel, can you hear us? So we understand oh. that uh, he must be having internet hey, challenge, hey, but have someone to I'm, help I'm him. happy. Yes. Hemo, can you continue on his behalf? This we, Chenan, uh, Chenan, please. Chenan. Yes, yes. Um, yeah. Please continue, thank you. Uh, all right. So I just continue from where Bramwell stopped. Yes, in Mombasa, we had uh, those youth who have decided to uh, have an initiative in the name of a peace walk um, so that they can sensitize other youth as well uh, in, in Mombasa in those violent prone areas so that they can, they can as well as uh, just have peaceful environments before the general elections come in uh, in August of this year. We saw that as a very good uh, initiative from the youths and uh, uh, we, we hope that we can have a way to help and support them in the initiative so that their dreams can come to pass and we can have a uh, peaceful coexistence. Uh, in training three, we had the, the, the public schools in Mombasa counties, eight, eight students from uh, those two schools, one was Moy Forces Academy, and um, the other school was Shikadabu Secondary School, as previously been mentioned by Bramwa. So all these trainees uh, were drawn from already existing peace clubs or money clubs in their, in their schools. And the students shared how important it is for them to have this peaceful coexistence among themselves. And they also mentioned um, that they, they, they have this, they have, they have this to, oh, thank you so much, Maria, for that reminder. Uh, please go to the next slide. Okay, so the relevance of the, uh, this training that we had. Uh, so just to summarize everything, we saw this as this hot sports, violent hot sports. Uh, where we train and we wanted to have uh, the youth in these places, in these schools, be able to have uh, this uh, training cas uh, cascaded into, uh, into their environments and into their communities so that they can have, um, they can have peace. So um, we, we also go to the next slide, please. Okay, so most of the youths in this experience in these um, areas they had especially the youth now uh, they had experiences uh, that they were willing to share and they shared experiences where some of them felt like they're not fully represented uh, in the local governments and in, especially in decision making uh, and in policy making as well so they saw that these clubs that are going to be formed that they will help them have a voice where they can speak about their issues and their needs. I kind of go to the next stage as we, as we conclude. Okay. So the participants were very excited about the activities that were shared, especially the diminishing islands and um, um, those activities, they were very realistic uh, and very relatable to real life. Uh, can we go to the next? Okay, so there are gaps uh, that needed to be filled, to be filled, and uh, one of one of it was interventions shown by enhancing social interactions th through transformative pedagogy uh, has a rich role in defining redefining uh, this building. So we also wanted to apply mechanisms which are inclusive of every member in the society by creating avenues that can be able to end extremism. As, as seen in these areas. So uh, people are not adequately informed in these areas. So having a platform where they can be informed will be, will be a good thing. And then uh, in schools, uh, as well as being, uh, having enough peace clubs to, to run in schools and which are active was another thing as well that we saw as a gap. And um, also, uh, to cascade this message of peace, 
uh, should be a focus of every system whereby Chinese become peace ambassadors among their peers. And finally, yeah, so, so the Chinese uh, perspective of peace uh, was supposed to be harnessed into, uh, into the interactions with others. So it's, uh, the training was very relevant to them, especially at this time where we are just going to elections. And we hoped that from this training, we can now be able to have even a more peaceful uh, environment where youth can, uh, cannot now be used by politicians in uh, promoting violence, but now we, they can be able to promote peace instead and be ambassadors of peace and be the mouth and the voice of those who can speak for themselves uh, in the communities. Uh, thank you so much. I, I, I know we have gone a little bit more past our times, but thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Ciprian and Bremian for, for uh, um, giving us this very good explanation and your work with the schools, the peace clubs, also uh, taking us through the different challenges that you go, talking about the importance of sustainability to scale up, to you know, go beyond what you just did. I think that uh, uh, it's very critical. I like when you mentioned in one of your slides about the, the importance of the social interactions for building peace. Peace is relational. And, and I think what you're doing of bringing uh, the different children, young people together, uh, constructing the spaces for dialogue, I think that's, that's a very critical aspect. So thank you for these experiences. And we invite the participants uh, uh, to write your questions on the chat so that we can collect them for the end. So I'm very uh, happy also now to invite our next panelist is Mr. Pietro Uso Shukuku, uh, apologies for, for, for the pronunciation, MacLeo, who will be talking about transformative pedagogy for positive peace in Nigeria. Mr. Pietro, Pietro represents the Rotary Nigeria, the National Peace, he's the National Peace Committee Chairman and the National Coordinator of Activating Positive Peace in Nigeria program. Pietro, the floor is yours. You have 10 minutes. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, with your permission, I would like to leave my camera off. Network seems to be a challenge today. Please, is my screen share invisible to everyone? Yes, yes. OK, thank you. Once more, my name is Pietro Uzochukuma Cleo. I'm a Rotarian, and I'm one of the participants of the Peace Building and Prevention of Violence Through Education Program organized by UNESCO ICBA in 2021. So having experienced that, I felt the need to cascade that initiative down to Nigeria and have a more tailored training for Rotarians and Nigerian peace builders. So I want to at this juncture especially thank Dr. Yerusalema for facilitating our proposal and making that um, training possible. Pretty quickly, let me introduce Rotary International and our program for activating positive peace in Nigeria. Rotary International, as you may know, is um, an international service organization whose objective is to bring together business and professional leaders in order to provide humanitarian services and to advance goodwill and peace around the world. And then our program for activating positive peace in Nigeria is an institutionalized peace structure and the Positive Peace Social Change Intervention Initiative engineered by Rotarians to deploy a coordinated socioeconomic response to promote peaceful coexistence, reinforce the eight pillars of positive peace and build peace infrastructures in Nigeria. Now coming to our training proper, our training was um, held on the 14th of February and it ran through to 24th of February. It was conducted online and then it's a national initiative. The publicity was put out there and 1,028 Rotarians and Nigerian peace builders applied. Let me quickly emphasize that our training is a training of trainer initiative. We're training peace builders that will go ahead and um, scale the initiatives they've learned. So our training was in partnership with um, Rotary Intercountry Committee of Great Britain, Ireland and Nigeria, UNESCO, IGBA, 
and their team Maruga to Africa Union. And also of importance is the Institute for Economics and Peace Australia. Let me add at this point that um, the Activating Positive Peace in Nigeria initiative is formulated with the IEP Positive Peace Framework, and that is the eight pillars of positive peace. Now, the, the, what um, transformative pedagogy helped us to achieve is to help participants or beneficiaries of this training to be able to understand the positive peace framework and to be able to utilize it in engineering local initiatives to address their community challenges. Now, as we all know, Nigeria is the largest um, population of black country in the world. But what you may not know is that there are 37 states and six regions in Nigeria. And these six regions have their peculiar challenges. Now take the Northwest, for example, but in the mainstream media internationally, all you hear is about the insecurity challenges and the violent situations in the country. But over here, you will see that the peculiar regions, the six regions have their very unique challenges. The Northwest, while they are battling with um, banditry, kidnapping, you know, the, the Northeast is rather battling with religious extremism. That's where you have the hotbed of Boko Haram crisis and extremists. Now, the Middle Belt, which is the North Central, is um, prone with um, Fulani and farmers' header clashes. That's where you have the farmers and the, and the Fulani nomadics uh, having violent issues over grazing routes come to the South-South region, the agitation is for resource control. That's the oil producing part of Nigeria. <clears throat> so their own agitation and issues of violent conflict has to do with economy and controlling their resources. While the Southeast Nigeria is about secessionist movement, they feel marginalized and not included in the scheme of things. So they want to have their own state. The Southwest region of Nigeria is about um, uterestiveness you know, um, uh, ritualism, blood money, and um, Yahoo, Yahoo, all those things you see online. So with these peculiarities, our training had to be national to train the trainers to be able to um, address their regional issues or their local communities pressing needs as we couldn't afford to generalize. And um, so that way you won't have a unified training. So our training method was really uh, inclusive, very engaging and provided an avenue for the beneficiaries to express themselves and bring their experiences to bear. Now out of those 1,028 uh, registrants, only 110 were successful. And when I mean successful, that means they were graded, they were scored, a self-assessment -ass examination was set and was meticulously marked. So in this process of grading them, salient questions were asked where they were made to formulate intervention initiatives that would address their unique local community conflict issues. So we saw projects that um, ran through from, um, from bullying to uh, corruption to all manner as is peculiar in wherever they were residents in. Okay. I must also point out at this point that some um, COVID-19 as we've actually emphasized has played a huge part both in exacerbating the realities in Nigeria and in affecting the mode of this training. In Nigeria, the harsh economic realities that COVID-19 brought in has seen a, a, a high increment in criminality because of the social challenges. Small scale enterprises are winding down and the government has not really been able to address economic issues judiciously. So we are seeing more criminalities, more rates in crime and all manner. And also we opting to have this training via uh, the social media, via we online webinar, as against a residency program had its aspect on economy as well, and also the mobilization capacity. Now coming to the implementation and the uniqueness of the training, like I mentioned earlier, the Activating Positive Peace Program is formulated with the IEP uh, positive peace framework. Just below it there, you will see the eight pillars of positive peace. Now, the whole initiative is to address or institutionalize peace building in Nigeria. So every of our initiative, any of our peace intervention programs 
must address either of these eight pillars as um, a reinforcing one would translate to the efficient, optimal attitude of the other one. So what we achieved at this point is to use the learner-centered approach of transformative pedagogy to teach the training of trainers, to teach the beneficiaries how to arrive at a suitable project initiative to address their local issues. Now, applying this uh, positive peace framework, the theory of change of if they do X, Y, Z, you know, this would be the result, made it so unique. And on their own, they were formulating beautiful projects. And I'll run you down some of these projects. It's so, it's so lovely that even up till now, as at this morning, I got off the call trying to still help um, a trainer to formulate a project on gender-based violence. And I can tell you that from 24th of February to today, they have um, implemented over 50 projects. And it's so beautiful to see them use transformative pedagogy, to see them address eight pillars of positive peace and to see theory of change at work. Now quickly, I'll draw your attention to the yellow border. The yellow border has to do with the project title, then underneath it, you will see the date, the location, the area of focus, number of beneficiaries, the project goal, and the trainer that actually implemented each of these projects. And then going forward, I would like to say that um, the, the learning for us is that uh, beneficiaries of the Bespoke have scaled down and implemented wonderful projects. And then what we like most, like I mentioned a while ago, is the convergence in all these things. And then uh, transformative pedagogy, being able to bring out the best, being able to show the, the beneficiaries that they can actually engineer interventions that would address their, their immediate community challenges without waiting for anyone to do it for them. So it was really, really very unique. Now, what the youth shared with us is so numerous to mention because for every community, like I told you about the six regions that have their peculiar challenges, and these trainers are scattered across the six regions. So for every initiative they want to embark upon, they come up with a very unique dimension of perspective. And then we help them to streamline these things to activate one or two eight pillars of positive peace and reinforce this peace pillar in their local community. Now the gaps and opportunities that um, we would like to point out, there is need for a more intense training on the positive peace concept, transformative pedagogy and theory of change. This would mold youths into experts at developing and implementing positive social change programs. Also, the opportunities therefore lies in the future trainings as Road Train Nigeria have adopted the Bespoke Peace Training as an annual workshop with a possibility to make it an in-person residency program. So Rotary has adopted this initiative and every year we'll be conducting this training because it's an avenue for us to identify more passionate local peace builders, integrate them into our national network of peace building or Rotary peace building in the country and help streamline their objectives to activate positive peace in Nigeria. What I like most of what was innovative as I earlier said, is the convergence, the way transformative pedagogy just keyed right in into what we are already working on, into our developed concepts, into our peace objective. It was so effortlessly done that when uh, succinct yeah, uh, Dr. Jerusalem and her team was presenting it, it was so beautiful and very comprehensible for the participants. Now, I would like to say that um, next step for us, all these are projects implemented by the beneficiaries, I must point out. So next step for us, like I said earlier, is that uh, these uh, this beneficiaries, the training of trainers, the participants of the 2022 Bespoke Training has been integrated into the Nigeria National Peace Building and Conflict Prevention Network. And our Rotary Network have 37 coordinators, each for each state of Nigeria. So they've been integrated into this network in their respective states, in their respective region, with an objective to reinforce the eight pillars of peace in that state. And then also this avenue would serve as a process to engage um, this year's cohorts and going forward other beneficiaries of the bespoke training. Secondly, uh, one of our key objectives of activating positive peace in Nigeria is to establish peace infrastructures in 
public schools and tertiary institutions. And we are in advanced talk with the Ministry of Education about the possibility of having peace clubs, of having certain topics of peaceful coexistence integrated in their curriculum. And we even donating um, peace builders to facilitate these trainings at no expense to the state, as there's cogent need to diffuse or dismantle certain parochial sentiments, certain um, disuniting messages that has been consciously or unconsciously infused on the young adults and children. Then lastly, uh, like I said, this training will be done annually. We're looking at having it as a residency program as against doing it online. If we could achieve this beautiful result with just online training two hours every day, imagine what we could achieve with um, a, 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 a residency program, a daily program where you have eight hours to drill them for them to participate in other training, undistracted, have various facilitators come to show them how these things are done. I think the results will be more than this. I think it will be more beautiful. And I think that uh, indeed peace is tangible and peace is achievable in Africa. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Pietro, also for this inspiring uh, um, report in a way with the lessons learned of all the work that has been conducted since the train the trainers. I see 50 projects uh, organized the different topics that were addressed, looking at the context of Nigeria with the different spaces that, um, and needs in the country. I think this is, a, this is very inspiring and equally to what our colleagues in Kenya were saying, the need for more sustainability so that it doesn't stay on this how this is continued. So very glad to hear about the, the idea of having the in-person training every, every year. I think that's a great uh, initiative. I'm very glad to hear that how the transformative pedagogy, which is what we are uh, sharing here, has fit very well into the, the whole concept of positive peace and the zero change that you have already outlined as part of the, of the bigger piece of, of this implementation. So excellent uh, contributions, and, and I see very uh, uh, many connections with the colleagues in Kenya that have been implemented in, in the schools, and as you mentioned, you know, creating the peace infrastructures with the peace clubs, as uh, the colleagues in Kenya have been doing. I think that's also a way forward. So thank you so much, uh, Pietro. Now we go to our next uh, panelist. We're a little bit late with our time, so I ask our next two panelists to really keep the interventions to 10 minutes. We are now move to Uganda. Uh, we have Mr. Yusuf Francis, who is uh, the coordinator for the Youth for Peace Initiative at the Makere University. And uh, Mr. Francis will be talking about inclusion of youth in universities and refugee for peace building and peaceful coexistence in Uganda. Francis, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Can everyone hear me? Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Please go ahead. All right. Uh, very good afternoon from Kampala, Uganda, ladies and gentlemen, and all protocol observed. And once again, this is Mr. Francis. Uh, I'm going to present on inclusion of youth, stroke refugee youth for peace building and peaceful coexisting in Rhino refugee settlement in Terrigo district in Uganda. And before I begin, I just wanted to give a brief background how we started. It came out as a result of the training with UNESCO Ikeba, and where the two talented and mindful youth who are really looking, looking to impact life in Uganda, Kampala, and it was through three individuals, two of them as a refugee, registered so refugee that is Jesus Francis and Wakachak, then Hillary from Uganda as a host community. So it has been really amazing that we able to bring out the knowledge that they attained from Pikema training last year and we put it on the practice and this as a result we came up with this initiative that could last for long. Please allow me to go straight into the, the presentation and that is the implementation how we impl implemented our project was through strategic planning as a team 
as I as a team that we are able to come up with so many structures that we are able to carry out our project. First, we looked at the environmental scanning, where we are able to look at the agent needs, gathering information, who needs this building, who needs the training. Then we look at the environmental scanning, we look at the strategic formulation of suitable practical context that we can use and train them to apply also to other youth. That's where we look at the strategy implementation where we're able to divide our roles as a group, as a team, and everyone able to execute their part. Then also look at the strategy evaluation. Now evaluation, we're able to come up with different evaluation for each session. And the session we had two days training, and that is in Rhino Refugee Settlement Camp, where so many MSA South Sudanese and the host community, then also some of the Congolese are also residing in that camp. Through that strategic planning, we are able to drop so many two days impactful and meaningful uh, training for the, for the youth. And that is by day one, we looked at the opening and analyzing our context. Then also we break down and we looked at the learning objective. When you look at the learning objectives, we, we drove in the day one, we had four objectives. For example, we, we the first objective was to develop a common understanding on the form of violence experienced in the refugee camp and the host community. In that way, we were able to engage them like they, they were sharing what is happening exactly. The second objective was to discuss the drive of violence in that refugee camp and the host community. You know, the drive of violence is really very important to understand the youth, what caused them to do that, to engage in violence. And in Uganda, we have observed so many things that have been happening. Throughout the election period, there is so much violence among the youth, who are the source of violence, they are engaging in violence. And you can also in the city camp, there's so much violence. Since the people have fleeing from South Sudan and other neighboring countries like Congo, you find that they have that violence in there. So when they come, they really, because they don't want to do it, but if they find themselves engaging in of violence in, in, in the level of self defense. Then the next object is to look at the whole understanding of tolerance. What is what is it is and how to be tolerant in a community, in our community, maybe the refugee community, the refugee community and the host community. Then lastly, the day objective look at the understanding of core concept concept of mediation and how it proceeds and the practical bit of it, the, the practice of mediation. Then we look at the second day. Second day we look at the understanding of conflict sensitivity. Conflict sensitivity in engage really is so important for the refugee youth in the Rhino camp and we were able to execute that through valuable uh, materials that we produce to them. Where we are able to then the second day we looked at the designing strategies to peace building, building peace strategy in the host community and refugee community. Please, you can go ahead in the next slide. Now, our target is uh, we targeted 67 refugee youth, however, we exceeded a lot part of our report that we target to look at the 67, and there were so much need that in a way that refugees in that community we are really in need of training peace building most of them are affected by, by conflict now when you look at the issues that is happening currently in Congo there's so much inflow of refugees in Uganda and most of them are youth recently I was just looking to youth there's so much inflow over four thousand refugees are flowing from January 2022 to Uganda, and most of them are heading to Rhino Camp and Nativale Camp. So uh, our training are only focusing on targeting the youth who in return and then be able to use the skills that we gave them practically to go back to their country and train more youth and also the same as to train other youth. Now, the challenges that is affecting the community in Rhino Camp, that is Terrible District, the Terrible District of, in a four village, because out of that village in Rhino Camp, there's over 42 villages. And out of 42, we're able to target six villages. And that is youth leaders who are, who are really engaging in peace building and other activities. They are trying to see their, 
revolving impacting their community. Then so the issue that they're affecting the villages there, are found villages in Rhino Camp, we looked at the the conflict, the historical conflict that really most of the South Sudanese and Congolese were there, the host community are affected with that. Then we look at the gender-based violence, we look at the domestic violence, and specific, I'll just mention some specific of the violence, but there are so many. Look at the land conflict, we look at the tribal conflict, then we look at the misinformation. Those are the major challenges that is happening there. Please, you can go to the next slide. Uh, you can move to the next slide. So, um, the, the relevant to our con context that we took there and the training, it was really that mediation plays a real important role in our life and in community. Now, we look at the mediation, it's a powerful tool that it cannot cause a lot of, let me say, it does not involve other, let me say, third party, maybe legal or officer or judge. So mediation can be used by everyone. Now we look at the peer mediation and we look at the community mediation. Those are the tools that we were able to use that to impact them. Because when you look at the peer mediation, I as a youth, I can use the mediation to help my friend who are involved in a conflict. I can help a group of maybe, let me say the Nuer who are there, or the Dinkas, or the other tribes who are conflicting between each other. So also the community mediation helps. So Mediation plays a lot of role and the benefits really to larger extent and does not involve a lot of resources to some extent. Then we look at the tolerance. When you look at the tolerance, how are we going to tolerate people in our community with different diversities, cultures, behavior, their appearance? So look at how can they accept each other. So we really did that. And when you look at the some of the photos we did, we developed a practical and active group session and the preliminary session where they can be able to discuss on how to use mediation and how to use tolerance and whereby we came up with a skit, giving them skit, how can they identify the problem they had, like the land conflict, gender based, they could come up with a problem and use the mediation to solve it, use the tolerance to solve it. And it was so amazing that you see those young, vibrant youth who are willingly the trainees are willingly to engage, and you can see their engaging activities. The skill that was so blowing to us in a way that it really shows that these youth are really worth it to train them and they are ready to take over the, the, their community with training other youth for peace building. Then we have looked at the factors that hindered our most of our training. As you can see, we were able to train few of the youth for certain reason of COVID, because when we are acquiring permission from the office of the prime minister going to the camp, it was really telling us to there with the, the guidelines. So we tried as much as possible and we improvised. Please, next to the slide. Yeah, then the highlights of the youth empowerment. I think it's really, it, as a team, it all shocked us that if the youth can be able to engage and come up with the, the the real issue that is happening and facing in their community. It's really amazing. You can see how the youth are in the photo. You can see how they present their skits and how they act like using skits. They use mediation and tolerance and conflict sensitivity. They came up with a with a skit on issues that is happening. One was gender based, which is looking at the family issue that conflict, then look at the community issue. So that is the highlight that gave us a really amazing hope that these youth are ready to take more. Out of six villages, we are able to train. I believe that those youth are going to apply those those training skills that we gave them. Then we look at the the opportunities. Now the gap, let me start with the gap that is there. Like inadequate training, capacity training for the youth. And one of the most amazing thing that we are able to acquire from there or interview them and the in impact that we created our being interview. And one of them may mentioned that youth are always excluded from peace building training and they always focus on the elders in that in Rhino camps, especially in those villages out of 32 villages, they only focus on Elders. So, youth, when our training went there, it was really that they needed that training of peace building, which 
really appreciate it. Then the gap was the second gap is access to information. The youth there are vibrant, they are, they are yearning for information and knowledge about peace building. So, like, internet access is very limited. They are limited materials because the materials is designed for them to really suit them very well in a way that they were able to send, they are able to print the materials and send them back to use them to read more. So then also attitude of participants. For example, some of the participants, are, to a smaller extent, some of the participants have lesser attitude because of the environment where they are. Everyone is idle, so they are used to the idleness of the environment. Then the opportunity, to have availability of labor who are talented and capable of carrying out peace building activities in Rhino Camp and beyond Rhino Camp, some of them might be able to go back to their country. So they will be the agents of peace, ambassadors of peace. So we can be able to use that availability of the youth who are idle and can really engage. Then we have the positive attitude of the youth who are planning. It's really amazing. Then readiness of the youth in, in, in impacting their communities. So when you look at youth who is ready to engage in passing their youth is really amazing. Then they, Francis, the you, is, Francis, if you can yeah. wrap up, if you can wrap up, uh, the time is over, but if you can, you know, quickly wrap up, there are the conclusions. Yeah, yeah, the thank conclusion. you. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, I can conclude by saying this uh, personal commitment to strengthen, to strengthen the use of transformative pedagogy and peace building to empower youth are by staying committed as a team. And our initiative is really to stay committed and through engaging youth and we forming clubs as previous presenters have said, we have already formed clubs in the Rhino Camp villages and we are able to empower so many. And our next project is to engage with the youth at Kampala because most of the violence are happening also in the Makere University. That's our target, and through volunteering act, we can be able to impact our society and reduce the violent extremism in Uganda and Kampala. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Francis. Very inspiring uh, as well. Very comprehensive process, very detailed from the beginning uh, with the evaluation, the planning, very structured and excellent results as, uh, as well. Uh, in a very difficult context with so many challenges and, and you have done great. And you mentioned the contextualization, the use of participatory methodologies, the transformative pedagogy in, in, in action and very much reflected in all the activities, the critical thinking that was created also in the discussions um, and the idea of engaging also the secondary schools now in, the, in, in, in this process. So thank you so much. And your colleagues also in the chat have been adding more information. I know it's very short time for all that you have to share. So very grateful for, for, for speeding it up and, and apologies for interrupting. So we go to our last uh, panelist. We move to Zambia and it's uh, Ms. Gloria Kingoma. Uh, the founder of Zambia Peace Conflict Resolution and Development Initiative from the AU Southern Africa Youth for Peace Ambassadors. And Gloria is going to uh, speak about strengthening youth participation in peace building and conflict prevention through transformative action for peace in universities and colleges of Zambia. Gloria, the floor is yours. You have 10 minutes. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, we can hear you, go ahead. Okay. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, and I'm representing uh, the Youth Movement for Peace uh, in Zambia, uh, which has uh, implemented a project titled Strengthening Youth Participation in Peace Building and Conflict Prevention Through Transformative Action for Peace in Universities and Colleges of Zambia. Next slide, please. Uh, this is uh, just a photo showing uh, one of the uh, uh, participants uh, that we trained, and I'm going to share the experiences of youth empowerment towards transformative pedagogy for peace and resilience building uh, in relation to Zambia. Next slide, please. Um, with regard to the implementation and selection criteria, we looked at um, three uh, different provinces where we conducted a half-day workshop 
uh, that is in Southern Province, Lusaka Province, and Copper Belt Province. And uh, the selection of these universities was uh, based on uh, uh, the, the issues such as the electoral violence hotspots. Uh, the prevalence uh, in these uh, provinces was quite high. Uh, of course, not to mention, not, not to uh, dismiss the other seven provinces, all these uh, issues have also been happening. Uh, in addition, politically inclined student unions and incidences of mob, mob violence uh, that have been happening in these provinces, and hence uh, the selection. Uh, also, we looked at uh, COVID-19 exhibited intolerance and reduced peace discourses uh, in uh, these uh, provinces, which is also uh, uh, highlighted in all uh, at national level, rather. Uh, rather, the project was successfully implemented with 160 youth trained across the three provinces and uh, 25 different institutions of higher learning. Next slide. With regard to the project objectives, well, we are looking at uh, trying to create capacity in youths by promoting ad by promoting and advocating for peace building messages at local level and national level, as well as uh, to reduce given the situation in the country where there has been a lot of uh, uh, ethnic uh, divides. Uh, we looked at how we can reduce stereotypes and pre prejudices and also uh, promote coexistence and er eradicate tribal divides. Uh, and of course, ultimately to uh, achieve so social cohesion in the communities. But most importantly, we are looking at how to empower youths uh, with ideas of trans transformative action through peace club formation in colleges and universities. Next slide. With regard with the uh, youth empowerment focus, um, these are the following learning uh, learnings that uh, were being disseminated during the, the workshops in the three provinces. Uh, the workshop was actually divided into three uh, categories or rather sessions. And the first session was looking at different understandings of peace and violence, uh, conflict trends uh, globally in Zambia. Uh, when we look at uh, Zambia, primarily the, the Global Peace Index actually indicates that Zambia has dropped from the 44th place to the 71st uh, most peaceful country, which is one of, of the worrying uh, trends uh, in, in the country, and also the more so that the country has the uh, the, the continent has been faced with uh, a number of uh, you know violent conflicts, and also its impact on youths. The youths have actually been uh, adversely uh, affected, uh, both economically and socially, and so. The way forward was to ensure that the youths are empowered, being the stakeholders uh, in, in our society to, improve, to be able to engage in peace building uh, awareness programs. The next section looked at transformative power of education. And uh, we looked at how education in itself can bring about negative and positive uh, uh, change, especially if uh, the, the the drive the, the primary movers of this education are not conflict sensitive. So we looked at how the youths uh, can be conflict sensitive in, as they carry out uh, transformative uh, education. We also looked at the role of education in place building in terms of how uh, the youths can engage uh, in uh, in this um, very important uh, and noble cause. Also, we looked at how, how planning programs uh, for peace clubs uh, should be enhanced. We looked at also formation of uh, peace clubs um, uh, in universities. The other session looked at um, promoting youth participation in peace building and conflict prevention. Uh, for this uh, for session, we primarily emphasize on how youths should have the knowledge and agency to influence uh, peace building activities, having the knowledge uh, in terms of uh, how the global narratives and policies have been uh, earmarked for countries to, to follow uh, in localizing you know, peace and development uh, strategies. Uh, for example, this SDGs, uh, primarily the Go 16 and Go uh, Sustainable Development Go 16 and 4, as well as the Agenda 2063 and Youth Peace and Security agendas. Uh, we also looked at how the principles of peace building should be included in their action, in their peace action activities to ensure that there is gender sensitivity, leadership um, uh, uh, carried out by youths to ensure ownership of the programs and also uh, ensure collaboration and partnerships 
uh, at a local level with the various stakeholders that they'll be engaged in. Set, uh, next slide, please. Uh, upon engaging uh, with the youth in various uh, platforms of dialogue, we're able to uh, come up with these issues affecting the youth in Zambia using the, you know, the, the conflict prevention tool, conflict uh, tree analysis, and this empowered them actually to use this uh, 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 tool to analyze their, their situations and the problems that are affecting them. If you look at the causes and the effects uh, that have been uh, outlined here, you discover that they cut across social, economic, and political uh, aspects which have actually affected uh, the, the youths more uh, in society. When you look at uh, the problems, uh, we, 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 the youths prioritize uh, gender violence, political violence, tribalism, uh, which cuts across uh, issues of identity, and these were flagged out um, to be one of the uh, most pressing issues across all the provinces that we 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 we, partic where we worked in. And uh, these are some of the issues that uh, cut across not only uh, to include uh, direct violence, but also uh, cultural and structural violence, and gives us uh, the impetus that uh, students need to uh, take action for these uh, issues that uh, they highlighted, and they were able to actually attest that it actually coincides with various assessments uh, that indicate that there has been an upward trajectory of structural vulnerabilities in Zambia. Next slide, please. The role of youth in education for peace building. This included um, looking at, uh, or it rather uh, uh, giving the space for youths uh, to discuss uh, using focus groups discussions uh, to dialogue at a uh, great length and these are some of the issues that they brought about to ensure that um, you know they engage into uh, education for peace building and they looked at sensitization which should happen at not at family level uh, in neighborhoods churches schools on the importance of uh, peace and conflict prevention they also emphasized uh, the use to be able to come up with youth-led initiatives youth to take up leadership positions to promote and collaborate for peace. And uh, the formation of school clubs was actually primarily um, appreciated and uh, it was imperative that uh, most institutions of learning should have peace clubs so that they can be able to uh, bring about innovative programs to promote peace and take action. Uh, Participants also uh, included um, engaging in peaceful dialogue and facilitate community exchange to coexistence and tolerance as one of the important roles that they should play. We found that most of these uh, roles, the, the tasks that they have uh, earmarked to do uh, are very much in line with how the societies should include youths uh, in promoting uh, peace education um, overall. So, the youths have also made a, committed to, a commitment to avoid uh, to being used as agents of violence, but rather to change the narrative as agents of peace. And this also calls for uh, capacity building for them to be assertive and be responsible citizens. Next slide, please. These are some of the practical approaches that uh, the participants were able to outline for them to be able to engage fully, to engage in uh, transformative action for peace. Uh, what was most highlighting in this uh, session was, to, was the fact that uh, students were able to understand that peace starts uh, within self. Inner peace is very important. And if you do not have the desire to promote peace, it's very difficult to give out peace. So we are engaging that people pe participate, uh, they're engaging, they're advocating that uh, society or youth should actually desire to uh, promote peace and should be promoted uh, by peaceful means. Um, they also looked at platforms for networking, which are available, which they can engage. Uh, also, this could be, a, uh, these platforms, they could be uh, uh, an entry point for workshops, as well as uh, campaigns, uh, peace campaigns and rallies, uh, also engaging uh, social medias for peace messaging. Uh, there's also um, collaborative, sorry, 
They also looked at how they can collaborate with stakeholders, including people, influential people in the communities. Other platforms that they could use uh, include publishing books and articles on peace and development related uh, issues, and also engaging in counseling uh, among uh, their peers. This could facilitate, uh, uh, you know, uh, programs for mental health, uh, uh, you know, uh, to, to address the issues of mental health and also to facilitate uh, inter-community inter dialogue and exchange. Uh, what was most uh, outstanding on this uh, session was the fact that uh, youths were able to, in, to uh, understand the relevance of engaging in fundraising and applying for community development funds for empowerment projects. So through these peace clubs, uh, we are expecting youths to be able to leverage this opportunity uh, to engage in uh, this kind of project that are being spearheaded by the government. Next, please. Gloria, Gloria, you have uh, just one minute if you can maybe wrap up with some of the conclusions and, and, and learnings. Yes. Thanks. Next slide, please. <clears throat> yes, given the, the opportunities that the community, the participants were able to uh, uh, provide, they looked at how they can engage with local leaderships political leaders, as well as uh, uh, religious leaders in trying to spearhead these programs. Of course, the challenges that uh, have been identified include funding to support and maintain peace clubs and uh, to increase the target number of participants so that we can have uh, a, a number of uh, youth trained. We also looked at strengthening linkages between institution management and community peace clubs and also limited government support to formal and uh, informal peace programs. If they can be uh, this kind of support at government level, we should be able to do uh, more work uh, in, in relation to peace education. Next, next slide, please. When it comes to the lessons learned uh, in relation to awareness, students ready, were ready, are readily available uh, to take up um, these uh, uh, to take up action for peace and they're looking forward to continuity and scaling down uh, to fellow students. Uh, with regard to implementation process, transformative pedagogy actually has proved not only to us as uh, facilitators but also the participants that it facilitates change of mindset and improves the impetus for youth to take steps to address the challenges they face. Workshop content was very applicable and insightful, however more is required to introduce normative frameworks such as the youth peace and security. Ketosy calls, of course, were done in to ensure stake stakeholder involvement, but more stakeholders need to be involved in these kinds of processes. We also um, uh, innovatively looked at how the uh, peace clubs can uh, democratically elect their uh, uh, peace club leaders. And this is what happened, and we also ensured that participatory methodologies uh, were established, including establishing of network networking groups uh, or, uh, or on, and social uh, related uh, uh, um, online medias. Funding is also one of the issues that we looked at as lessons learned. Uh, the project was implemented according to the, pro the, the, the budget. However, sustainability was very much uh, uh, important in terms of uh, how we can uh, continue to scale down this uh, project. Next slide, please. With regard to the way forward, we'd like to um, <clears throat> build on upon the One Zambia, One Nation motto by creating a national coordination committee for peace clubs and universities and be able to develop policy briefs on peace education and the need to cultivate a culture of peace in Zambia. And most importantly, most importantly to create capacity by training appointed peace clubs leaders uh, uh, in the institutions that participated. Next, next slide, please. These are some of the picture focus. Uh, this is a Lusaka workshop where uh, the, 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 the participants were able to dialogue in a more safe uh, environment. Next, please. This is uh, the Copper Belt a province workshop and the Southern uh, province workshop where you see uh, participants actually uh, geared for action um, upon completion. Next slide, please. Overall, the project was successfully conducted uh, with due realization and consideration of the court. Since wars begin in the minds of men, it is in the minds of men that defenses of peace must be constructed. As a peace movement, we envision peace action 
uh, in the near future, which can transform Zambia into a more peaceful society. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you, uh, Gloria, uh, for these uh, explanations, sharing the experiences, tremendous work that you have been doing with your team in Zambia. Um, a lot on what you said resonates very much with what others are saying to provide continuity, reaching out to different stakeholders, uh, the need for more uh, resource mobilization, uh, more time for the trainings that you have uh, mentioned. But I like the recommendations also on youth engaging more in research, in policy recommendations, in concrete uh, projects. And also the emphasis that in your in the content and the programmatic part, you, you also gave to the identity issues, which are also critical in addressing uh, sometimes issues of violence in, 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 in our context. So thank you so much, uh, Gloria. We are very, very over the time, and it's my responsibility as, uh, as a moderator because the, all the four presentations have been very, very interesting, and I haven't been very good at keeping the time. But you have done great. There are many comments on the chat congratulating you for the excellent work, for the you know sharing more about the details. And there are some questions. I'm gonna um, just read the questions, and I'm gonna give one minute to each of the teams, and it can be the presenter of other members of the team to respond. But you only have one minute to respond because then we have. Uh, Dr. Temito Peaco giving the closing remarks. So if you allow me to take uh, uh, five minutes more, uh, I read the questions. So the first question is for the team in Kenya. To what extent do politicians use youths to engage in violent acts during elections in Kenya? Did participants mention the cause of violence during elections? Any plans for peace campaigns as Kenya gets into an election period? So you think about the, the, the answer one minute and I read the next question. The next question is for Nigeria. What is the political goodwill in response to peace training that you undertook, especially in the northern side of Nigeria? How do interfaith peace clubs support effective re reduction of youth extremism? How were you, be, you able to package positive peace messages in a country that has reached diversity and to some level a deep rooted religious divide. Then the other question, this is for, uh, uh, for all, um, is there any way of doing an impact assessment of this uh, training? So colleagues from Zambia and from Uganda, if you can also respond to this uh, uh, question. Um, and then could you please share with us some of the examples of youth led initiatives in, in Zambia? So these are some of the questions. So uh, the floor is for each team to reflect on this question for one minute. So we start with Kenya. Kenya team, please. Colleagues yeah. from Kenya. You, you uh, Eunice, Eunice, you can respond kindly. I can see Adiza. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. This is Eunice from uh, Kenya. Uh, to respond to the question on uh, politicians uh, influencing youth in uh, uh, in conflicts, yes, uh, during elections, most of the time politicians uh, engage youths uh, by um, involving them to attack their uh, their, uh, their, uh, their 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 political uh, aspirants, and also by giving them money uh, so that. Uh, uh, they can uh, make a lot of noise during these rallies and also involving them in conflicts by giving them some weapons. Um, these are really affected youths and uh, most youths are now going towards the political, different political parties, being aligned by different political parties and, and causing chaos. During our, our training, we realized that some of the causes uh, from the participants that uh, uh, was uh, cultural based, uh, most, uh, uh, polit uh, political uh, election related violence are caused by uh, ethnic uh, variation and uh, this uh, causes a lot of uh, conflicts when within the youths whereby they uh, see each other uh, based on their ethnic groups and also the uh, the, the the issue of uh, unequal distribution of resources whereby youths uh, different regions are different are, are, uh, are given different resources some are I feel inadequate uh, in political power. Yes, 
And when you are, when you are doing uh, our, our training, uh, one way of assessing the impact of the training was through giving our participants uh, feedback forms, or we call them evaluation forms, whereby they could, uh, we, could access, they could, we could access their level of uh, knowledge in terms of the topic discussed, and also the, by taking part of their, in the activities. Also, one of the things that we realized that if after the training, some of the participants uh, propose so that you can support them in different activities in peace walks before the elections uh, period in Kenya in August. And also we are able to create uh, peace clubs, which will be a monitoring uh, uh, aspect of it so that you can uh, monitor the, uh, the, the success of these peace clubs. And also we form uh, social media groups where the youths I will post some of the success stories and what they're doing in the grassroots. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Inis. Very good uh, answer. So um, Nigeria team, you had several questions. If you can try to be very concise in the next uh, minute, please go ahead. Okay, okay thank you very much. Um, I would like to group the political will question together with the interfaith and diversity. Uh, Nigeria is a heterogeneous country and um, with very gray areas concerning um, the angle you tilt. And that is why Rotary International has been um, a very formidable organization to use to advance peace objectives in the country. As we know, Rotary International is apolitical, is not a religious organization and has been neutral with our approach in dealing in all parts of the world. Even in Ukraine and Russia, it was amazing to know that there are Rotarians in both sides of the country uh, lending their voice to peaceful coexistence, to dialogue and to world understanding. Now, let me say that um, peace building is, has a very thin line between uh, what it is and being political. So we trade very cautiously in our approach and so far it has made our interventions to be acceptable in all divides of Nigeria be it Christian territory, Muslim territory, or every other political dichotomy of the country, being that it is Rotary and they know Rotary for its neutral stance. Coming to impact assessment, impact assessment has several levels for us. Ours is not a one-off project, it's not even a 10 years project, it's a project that has come to stay. Uh, Rotary has a signature project as to end polio, now we have successfully ended polio in Nigeria. Our next key objective is to end violent conflicts. So impact assessment for us, what would, um, what would the good result be for us is an end to violent extremism, an end to violence, an end to um, lack of good neighborliness and so many things. So while we evaluate this training of trainers at their level and what they are doing, there's also a larger scale of prison, and there are also a larger scale of, of expected deliverables. And this, yeah, this happens to when we start seeing less of so many things, less of stereotypes, less of religious crisis, less of extremism, less of um, Boko Haram activities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pietro. Thank you so much. Then uh, for our colleagues in Uganda, also for your reflections, there is a particular question here for you that uh, we didn't read is how transformative pedagogy have uh, helped addressing issues of trauma among the, the uh, uh, refugees. Uh, so if you can share about that and also reflections on, on assessment as well. Thank uh, you, the first question. Francis, uh, regarding the role of transformative pedagogy in addressing trauma uh, in, in refugee community, and, and maybe if there is any plan on doing assessment, and, and you know, if the, you, know, you have done some more concrete assessment, and where are the, the plans, how easy that would be, particularly in the challenging setting that, that you are working in. All right, uh, thank you so much once again, and really uh, to address the issue of trauma, and as you can see, I brought the one module that we used, we designed for the refugees there, that is the conflict sensitivity. And in terms of conflict sensitivity, it speaks of mostly how we can be sensitive about people, people who are, let me say, affected by a conflict for a long time. Now, in that conflict sensitivity, the session we had is how are we able to communicate with each other? We have to respect how 
if I if I am a leader in that community or if, if I'm in that community, I will use conflict sensitivity in a way that how am I going to communicate with someone? If I know someone is affected by a conflict, and definitely when someone is being affected by a conflict, being historical conflict or tribal conflict, definitely you will notice that the person is affected, is traumatized. So my language really matters to approach that person. So conflict sensitivity in a way that it covers that bit of, to some extent it covers that bit of trauma. But however, the issue of trauma, it really needs counseling in which we are able to do our counseling with them. It's after our objective because our objective was to train them on peace building. But after the training, we had some a serious session of just talking and finding out, interviewing them, what is affecting them. So we are able to talk with some of the leaders. I personally I did peer counseling. I acquired the knowledge of peer counseling. I was able to share with one of their leaders, chairman, and that is Peter, and he was able to really like really I'm um, in touch with him. I have given him some materials on issues of counseling. So that I hope that one I've answered and conflict sensitivity really helped us on that the people who are traumatized. So we were able to be careful with what we give them, what we presented to them, what we train them about. So that's it. Then the impact impact assessment is really great that in my first part of the presentation we talked about strategy evaluation. And we, we, speaking of strategic planning, we had both long and short term goals. And our goal in that during the training was to impact the trainees with skills and knowledge. And we have several assessments after every session, the two sessions we had on mediation, on concepts of mediation and form of violence and conflict sensitivity and tolerance. We had design evaluation how the the topics and the session that we train them with has impacted them and the result is so amazing in a way that they really understood what we gave them and the impact of our going and training the youth who are there it is really great impact in a way that one of the things I can quote after my interview with one of them it was how they can be able to use the mediation that is here and and community mediation, it's really impacted them. They cannot, they cannot be able to wait for other mediators. Let me say you have to pay mediators to come and help you solve the conflict. And it really gave us, as a team, we were, we were so happy that the objective we came up with there, it was really fulfilling, where they will be able to use mediation. They will not wait for maybe office of the prime minister or third party to come in. Thank you so much. And we are following them up because of their program to give them designing strategies for, for their community. And we are going to do follow up on that activities and how they can be able to guide them on implementing them. And also, yeah, for long term implementation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Francis. This is uh, very insightful. We go to, to Zambia, uh, Zambia team for the, the question, more concrete examples of activities, youth activities. But just for all the teams, if you can think of one concrete recommendation that you would give with the experience implementing the transformative pedagogy, the challenges that you have highlighted, what would be your main recommendation uh, for other teams of young people, also for UNESCO, for Arigato, for the African Union, and for the different partners that are joining us uh, today? If there is one or two recommendations that you can uh, make uh, before we, we close. Um, but before we go to Zambia, and then we do the, the quick round for all the teams. So Gloria or the other members of the team, if you'd like to, to share about the question, the concrete activities. Yes, um, uh, if I, yes, thank you. If I got very well, uh, uh, the question is about uh, the, the, the youth-led uh, initiatives that are in Zambia, that have been spearheaded in Zambia. Um, they, they are not primarily uh, but done by the peace clubs that have been uh, formed, but it was um, it was just, it was just a, re a reflection of how the other youth-led initiatives that are prominent in Zambia have actually made an impact in in, in our society. And there are quite a number of uh, you know youth-led initiatives, but I, I will mention quite a few. We have uh, the Youth for Peace um, initiative 
that is providing peace education uh, programs online to youths that have actually subscribed to uh, the, 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 the network platforms that they have established. And these have actually been recognized uh, by the Zambia Army, which uh, supports uh, financially and also other logistical support that uh, the, the project is, is undertaking. We also have uh, the Bumba Lambo Foundation, which is actually addressing uh, gender-based violence and is providing counseling um, services to the to the, to the, the victims of uh, gender-based violence. And this actually, the reflection was that uh, uh, the students can also, you know, uh, try to learn best practices uh, from this uh, kind of uh, organization. Uh, I'll also look at Zambia Peace Conflict Resolution and Development Initiative, which I'm spearheading. It also uh, focuses on youth and women. We, have, we hold webinars on um, uh, 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 social media platforms, uh, trying to educate uh, the youths on the various normative frameworks uh, that have, have been established, such as the Agenda 2063, Youth Peace and Security Agendas, and other uh, topics uh, related to peace and development. So this is a, a step ahead to towards educating our society and uh, towards uh, in including the youth in early warning and conflict prevention activities in our country. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gloria. Um, I like also in the, in the presentation before when you talk about the, the, the change in mindset and how transformative pedagogy has addressed the, the you know, changing the mindset of, uh, of young people. And I see on the chat several of the participants talking about that, particularly in the context of Kenya with elections and, and, and violence uh, uh, related. So the role of media also that play in, in narratives of, uh, of violence and how de to deconstruct these, uh, these narratives as well. So very, very relevant all the, the, the examples. So we go very quickly to each of the teams. So we go back to Kenya for one concrete recommendation. So members of the team in Kenya, what would be your recommendation? Your concluding remark. Uh, hello. Eunice, uh, go ahead. If I may add on um, the recommendation that I'll give one of the gap that you realize is that um, Youth are eager and have become a great change agents in Kenya. But uh, one thing that is lacking is capacity of youth to be involved, both at the uh, leadership level as um, in, in, in the negotiation um, uh, uh, tables and also in the decision making tables. Youth need these, uh, these skills and the knowledge of how to express uh, their needs, especially when it comes to violence and peace building so that uh, for us to for us to domesticate the uh, UNSPR uh, 1325 and also the African Union Youth for Peace uh, agenda in, uh, to into the national level, youth need this knowledge and uh, also being given that uh, opportunity to express themselves on the decision making levels. So our our, our urge is to do more training for the youth and give them the knowledge they need so that when they are doing the peacekeeping and peace building initiatives in the country, they know what to speak about and also uh, to teach others because we are just um, agents here and we want to reach to more youths uh, at the grassroots level. How can we do this? Can we do this when uh, more youth are trained and they are trained in the specific agenda, which is uh, uh, the, the link peace, peace building um, aspect of it and also being engaged in the leadership uh, level so that uh, the agenda of the youth can be heard and can be presented in the, at the national level and also a regional and international level. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, and it's very important recommendation. Strengthen the capacity of youth, strengthen the opportunities and spaces for them to be seated at the negotiation level in helping to make decisions. So creating more, more spaces. So this is a, an excellent recommendation. Thank you. Uh, Nigeria team. So in addition to capacity building, I would recommend collaboration and multilateralism approach. You know, there are lots of um, beautiful peace initiatives and organizations littered across Africa and across various countries in Africa. But there's need to have a cohesive approach to peace building. There's need to be progressive. There's need to be strategic and systematic 
and consistent. So for that, to arrive at that consistency, there's need for collaboration. You need to leverage on what is already existing and what you are providing. You need to compare notes and see what's working and what works best, what you could adopt, what you could initiate in your respective location. So my parting word will just be collaboration and have a united front to peace building and have the objective of a certain goal to advance peace building in your respective countries as against everybody working on their own or being competitive in mindset. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pietro. Very thoughtful recommendation. I think in this field, we are, and in many fields, we, we work in silos and we need to break those silos and create synergies. So your call for collaboration you know, among different organizations. And here with this example, we have learned so much of the work that you have been doing. And there is so much that we could strengthen working more collaboratively, networking, but also among all other organizations and sharing these experiences in Africa with other parts of the world. I think it makes uh, a lot of sense and it would be such an inspiration, uh, inspirational initiative. Team in Uganda, please go ahead with your recommendation. Uh, thank you so much, and I would just like to add on the recommendation of my colleagues that has already added some on the chat there. And one of my recommendations is uh, to continue to support the youth initiative because it's really powerful that youth approach to fellow youth is really amazing, and our project really is a positive response that if youth can do this, that means there is greater impact especially in peace building and also counseling. Counseling is very important. You can be able to take those two things as a go. And probably one of the panelists suggested some excellent program between the initiatives. For example, in Uganda, could be able to be able to go to Kenya and exchange ideas practically, physical people that could be able to affect you of the leaders and also engage with the locals and exchange the, the knowledge they acquired. Other than that, I would like to appreciate that they should continue with this wonderful initiative and supporting the initiative and youth in general, in engaging in peace building and also above other activities that they are engaging in also. Thank you so much. Thank you, Francis. Uh, another great recommendation to continue the, the, the support. You all talk about giving more sustainability to your programs. You don't want this to be a one-off and you are doing many efforts to create foundations to make it sustainable. So you're not just relying on others to make it sustainable. You are creating the foundations for them. And that particular recommendation on the exchanging, uh, exchange program with different countries, Kenya, uh, Uganda, exchanging knowledge, expertise, experiences, ideas. I think that's a great recommendation, Francis. And then the team in Zambia, your last recommendation. Yes, uh, thank you so much. Um, looking at uh, the youth um, as the primary movers of uh, you know, peace, and we would like to see uh, as what uh, the others have alluded to, continuity and sustainability of these uh, uh, peace education programs more so that most youth are not very much conversant with the youth peace and security agenda, including the women peace and security agenda and other normative frameworks that can, they can use to drive uh, this kind of trans transformative change. Uh, the other issue is uh, looking at uh, the various uh, sectors that uh, are in, involved in our society because peace uh, affects peace and conflict affects everybody. So would like to recommend that uh, we ensure national dialogue include not only political leaders, youths, but also other sectors such as business entities that actually can buy in into these peace values, uh, peace strategies, and collectively we can have uh, systems that have a peace lens in, in the way we initiate development for all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gloria. Excellent. Mm, intersectoral collaborations. Peace is built together. And you have uh, made, made a very important call to work together with different sectors, including the private sector. I think this is an excellent uh, um, recommendation as part of the transformative pedagogy is engagement of the community. You know, religious leaders, the business community, parents, caregivers, 
the government, policymakers, uh, health sector. I think that is critical for the efforts that you are doing. So thank you so much for all the recommendations. Uh, I'm not attempting to summarize any, uh, any of, the, of the points here. I think it has been very clear, loud and clear on the great work that you are doing, the excellent uh, results that you are having, the importance of the sustainability and to continue supporting your work. Now, uh, to finalize, I want to invite Dr. Rooks, Temi Topeako, apologies if I'm pronouncing the, the name incorrectly, from the African Union Youth for Peace for the closing remarks. Dr. Rooks, the floor is yours. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me to make these uh, closing remarks. Um, let me start off by saying that at these things, I don't come with a prepared speech because I like to respond organically to what has gone on in the sessions. And I must say that this and, you know, it's this is one of the most engaging uh, sessions that I've attended in a really long time. But before I go into that, let me, uh, of course, uh, stand on existing protocols and, um, of course, thank um, UNESCO Igba Ariagato as well, uh, who have been working uh, with the African Union uh, Youth for Peace Africa team. Um, it's 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 a wonderful delight to see that discussions that we were having a few years back have actually brought this sort of invigorating conversations and evidently. Um, UNESCO IGBA is making the desired changes when it comes to uh, peace building education. Um, let me not take too much time, but I would like to refer to two of the closing remarks, one from uh, Eunice and one from Pietro to sort of summarize um, what has gone on today. Eunice made mention of the need to have more capacity building of youth on normative frameworks. I can't agree more. I think the understanding of young people of normative frameworks not only provides them with that essential intellectual background to do what they do on the field, but it also enables them the opportunity and the knowledge to hold governments accountable to things that they have uh, signed up to as well as other institutions, including uh, multilateral, such as the AU, such as UNESCO. Um, but also, it also bestows on them the responsibilities that they have even as youth organizations or youth networks, or as young people, as individuals themselves. So I, I can't agree more. Um, Pietro also made mention of building on networks uh, and collaborations, and I, 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 I agree. Um, listening to the comments from uh, Zambia, I was amazed at the number of uh, youth uh, organizations focused on, on, on peace building education. And what this tells us is that we are, if we're able to come together to harness our comparative advantages to work together, there is certainly scope to achieve all the recommendations uh, that have been made today. I've mentioned just two. I think there's also a challenge here for the partners that are involved in this project, and that is to chart a way forward in terms of ensuring the sustainability of this effort, to ensure that the capacities of young people, and this is where it's most important because youth, as a demographic is not static. So as some graduate from youthhood today, a new set will be coming in. So capacity building of youth cannot end. It's a continuum. And I think this is a challenge that I'm putting forward to our partners that we must continue to be unrelenting in our efforts to ensure that we have um, the necessary resources uh, to uh, meet the challenges. But there's also a challenge for young people and their networks. 
and that is to get over the feeling of competition or that individualism, there is more room for everyone and there's greater result to be achieved when we come together realizing where we have our strengths to deliver as one. Let me say that the Youth for Peace Africa program is unrelenting in its primary objective, which is to ensure that young people are mainstreamed into the peace and security arena and agenda of the African Union. And that in doing so, we're working with a plethora of institutions ranging from regional economic communities to regional mechanisms, to development partners, to youth networks themselves, to ensure that we reach out to the large amount of youth that are contributing immensely to peace and security in Africa. Let me quickly touch on a program that we have, um, the Youth Amb Ambassadors for Peace. There are five of them, one representing each region. All of them are currently at the Aswan Forum advocating the voices of young people into COP27. And their role as ambassadors is to bridge the gap between the youth demographic and policymaking and policymakers. So please know your ambassadors, get in touch with them and use them to filter information to the AU and we can also feedback through them to you. There's a lot of work to be done out there. And I assure you that we will be unrelenting um, in, this, in this effort. Let me conclude by saying this about young people. Including this session, I continually hear the statistics of African youth as the greatest demographic. Indeed, this is the truth. But this is not the reason why young people should be immersed in peace and security. The discussions today have shown how resourceful young people are, how intellectually sound young people are, how their lived experiences are shaping their contributions to peace and security, how they are able to give recommendations on what the future should be like because they have lived the present. These for me together are the essence of promoting youth engagement and active participation in peace building. With these few words, I'd like to once again thank every one of you. This, 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 this has been really enriching and I am proud that Africa's youth are fully engaged and are continuing to engage through these platforms in contributing to Africa's peace and security agenda. Of course, I must also thank my colleagues at Arigatu, Arigatu UNESCO, IGBA, and all the other dignitaries that have joined today. Um, the interpreters have also been with us, uh, I, I believe. Um, I just want to thank everyone so, so much um, for, 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 for the efforts that have been put into this process as I look forward to even more. I thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ako, for this uh, wonderful closing remarks, encourage, encouragement for the young people, the full commitment of the African Union. But as I hear you speaking, also your personal commitment and belief in the, the power of young people. So thank you so much uh, also for the collaboration, for the opportunity to work together. This is a reflection of what the young people are asking us to work together. So thank you so much uh, for this commitment and for these closing remarks. Um, thank you so much everyone participants for uh, being with us in this amazing two hours of inspiration. 
the chat was extremely active with a lot of comments and congratulations and questions. Thank you so much, Nigeria, Kenya, Zambia, and Uganda for the excellent work sharing uh, the experiences, for inspiring us and keep up the good work. Thank you, UNESCO, IGBA, uh, Dr. Yumiko, Jerusalem, and team for bringing us together and for all the preparatory work uh, in, in making this happen. Thank you so much. And we close the, 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 the webinar today. There will be a fourth webinar coming up on the 4th of 6th of July. This will be in French, I believe. And um, please share the word also with your colleagues. And I will be sharing the recording of this, uh, of this webinar as well as the, as the presentations. So thank you for joining us and have a good end of the day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, bye. Thank you very much, Maria. And thank you, Dr. Rooks. Thank you, Tim, Kenya, Zambia, Uganda. And yes, thank you very much, all of you, really. It was a very amazing and amazing session. And thank you very much. See you soon. Yes, in okay.